Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at a presentation analysis for dissociative identity disorder. I'll refer to this as DID. DID is arguably one of the most controversial disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. First, I'll briefly talk about what DID is. I'll look very quickly at the controversy and then get into this particular presentation example, this case study. It's important to note here, though, that this particular case study is on DID, but I see things a little bit differently. So I'll go through at the end and cover my opinions on this particular case study. So dissociative identity disorder is in the dissociative disorder section of the DSM. So it's an official mental disorder. And it has three main components in its definition. The disruption of identity characterized by two or more distinct personality states. We refer to these different personalities as alters. We see recurrent gaps in the recall of everyday events, personal information, or traumatic events. And it causes clinically significant distress. Generally, early traumatic experiences are thought to be etiological for DID, meaning we believe that they have some sort of contribution in terms of causing the disorder. The difficulty, of course, is that many presentations of PTSD have the same etiology, and PTSD has a lot in common with DID. Amnesia for some parts of the trauma and associative flashbacks reliving the trauma during which an individual is not fully aware of their surroundings. In theory, DID has some symptoms that you would not expect to see with PTSD, which helps us to differentiate the two disorders. For example, amnesia with everyday events, we would think would be with DID and not be with PTSD. Dissociative flashbacks where the content of the flashback is forgotten, we wouldn't expect that with PTSD. Dissociative identity states that are disruptive to the individual's sense of self, right? that we wouldn't expect to see with PTSD and full bone changes between identity states. So a few different things here that differentiate DID and PTSD. Sadly, some individuals do try to fool counselors and other mental health professionals into believing that they have DID. This happens once in a while. When individuals pretend that they have DID, they tend to focus on the symptoms that are made popular in the media, like having different personality states and amnesia. And they may even report that they enjoy having the disorder, or they may report that they like having attention from mental health professionals. People who actually have DID are often ashamed that they have the disorder and feel overwhelmed by the disorder. They tend to underreport symptoms or deny their condition. Also, DID is highly comorbid with depression, and when people are pretending to have DID, they typically forget that depressive component, so they don't act in a way that's depressed. People who actually have DID, of course, as I mentioned, tend to have depression at the same time. So we see several schools of thought when it comes to DID and its legitimacy and its etiology, what causes it. We see the traumagenic school of thought, and this says that DID is caused by trauma. This school of thought, of course, is consistent with the idea that the disorder is real. We see the iotrogenic model. This is where DID is caused by the clinician. The clinicians tend to like extreme cases, unusual cases, so here they may encourage the client to show signs of the disorder. Here, of course, the disorder is thought of as not being real. We also see the pseudogenic model here. This is when somebody is malingering. They're trying to convince the counselor they have the disorder when, in fact, they do not. So essentially, this boils down to the traumagenic theory versus the iotrogenic and pseudogenic, because both the iotrogenic and pseudogenic have this not being real component to them, right? So they're kind of grouped together. Now, even though we see these separate schools of thought about DID, they could be combined for any particular presentation. For example, somebody who has legitimate dissociative symptoms could be considered to have DID, but then the counselor could encourage that client to expand on the symptoms. So we could see a traumagenic and an iatrogenic component on the same person, right? Those two different factors could be weighing in on the same case. So this issue of different schools of thought and how it works for a particular instance, these get a little bit confusing. 
Currently, if we look at the research literature, we see that this is a very polarizing issue, with each side declaring victory. Most clinicians, in my experience, do not believe the disorder exists or they're skeptical. However, many counselors do believe it does exist as it's described in the DSM. Among the group of people that do believe the disorder exists, there's a small and persistent group of clinicians who claim to observe a substantial number of individuals with this disorder. So they don't really fall into any category really clearly because they're taking kind of an extreme position. Again, many of those who believe the disorder is real still believe that there aren't many cases, right? So they're not saying it's widespread. They're just saying it could be happening. And again, we're seeing this small group that says not only does it happen, it happens all the time. And some of them claim that up to half of their caseload has DID. Now, I'm not going to get into the issue of whether DID is real or isn't real. I've talked about this at length before in prior videos. So outside of this debate, some of the counselors who are highly invested tend to produce a number of case reports, presentation examples. Many of these are presented in very small trainings among other counselors who are highly invested or highly interested in this topic. It's not unusual that as part of these presentation analyses, there's a video recording, usually one that shows a client moving from one identity state to another, so from one altar to another altar. Now moving on to this particular presentation example, these are also again called presentation analyses, case analyses, case studies. I'm going to use these terms interchangeably. But they come about when a clinician is interested in using a client's presentation for educational purposes. The counselor would ask the client for consent. If consent is given, the client writes up a case report. And this case report could be featured, again, as a presentation, as part of a training, a conference, or even in some cases, published. Details of the actual presentation are changed to protect the identity of the client, even though a consent was signed. The clinical essence of the case, however, at least in theory, is still retained. So it's not really altered by changing some of the other information. This particular presentation example was given at a small training by a counselor who actually saw the client. I'm going to call this client Tammy, and I'm going to refer to the counselor as Diane. So the client is Tammy, the counselor Diane. Tammy initially came into the agency where Diane worked and was treated for post-traumatic stress disorder by another counselor. In one of the sessions, Tammy mentioned a state of unreality, so derealization, which of course can happen with post-traumatic stress disorder. The counselor referred Tammy to Diane because Diane was known in the agency as being someone very interested in anything to do with dissociation, including potentially dissociative identity disorder. Diane took over Tammy's treatment and continued to treat the PTSD in the beginning, but was also interested in exploring the potential for DID. Diane mentioned this interest to Tammy. Diane also had DID training certificates prominently displayed in her office. Diane would treat Tammy for a period of one and a half years. Then there was a two-month hiatus, and I'll explain what happened there. And then we see one more year of treatment after that. So two and a half years of treatment altogether. Tammy is a Caucasian female. She's in her early 30s, not married, no children. She had one long-term relationship that just ended prior to therapy. She worked at a local service company. She had an extensive legal history. She had been arrested and convicted five times for retail theft and had spent several weeks in jail for theft. The employer wanted her to seek therapy as they were worried that her legal history might affect what happens with them. They were thinking she might start stealing from them, but they really liked Tammy, so they strongly encouraged therapy. I'm not sure she really had a lot of choice in terms of coming into therapy. Tammy had a history of substance use, but was not currently using at the time when she was being treated by Diane. Tammy had been the victim of abuse and maltreatment when she was younger. She had betrayal trauma, and this took place over the course of many years. Tammy reported having flashbacks from those experiences, feeling depressed, angry, anxious, having concentration and memory problems, and having difficulties in romantic relationships. She tended to idealize romantic partners, then devalue them. So she seemed to love them, then she seemed to hate them, and this cycle would continue. She had difficulty regulating her emotions, and she was afraid of being left alone. She was afraid of not having a romantic partner. Tammy's family members took sides against her. 
They accused Tammy of making false allegations in reference to her traumatic experiences. She had no meaningful contact with any of her relatives except for one of her younger sisters. A few weeks into treatment, and this is treatment with Diane, Tammy brought up how sometimes she feels like a little girl. Diane adjusted the therapy to focus on this disclosure and gave Tammy some literature on DID. When Tammy returned to therapy for the next session, she indicated that she believed she had DID and was happy that there was somebody she could talk to about these symptoms. She also asked if she could join a DID support group that met at the agency. Over the next several months, new alters were revealed in therapy, in addition to the little girl that was talked about before. We see the introduction of a few older women alters who had antagonistic dispositions, and eventually we see several younger female alters and adolescents were also revealed. And these individuals had various types of personality characteristics, including being impulsive, irresponsible, vindictive, happy, vulnerable, and agreeable. So a lot of different traits being revealed in these alters. Tammy indicated that she was enjoying this exploration, and she never knew that DID could be so much fun. Diane warned Tammy that she would have gaps in her memory, meaning that Tammy would be expected to have memory problems because that's what happened with DID, but Diane told her not to worry about it. Again, it was considered typical. Tammy reported that she didn't have amnesia and that she remembered everything that each alter ever said or did. Within a few months, in addition to the primary personality, there were 10 alters. Often in session, Tammy would switch to an alter and her behavior would become dramatic. The alter was distinctly different than the primary personality, but a lot of the alters were fairly similar to one another. On one occasion, Diane believed an alter was speaking Spanish, a language that Tammy had never studied. On a few other occasions, an ill-tempered alter would argue with Diane and refuse to remit the copay, and this started to occur quite often, so that essentially Tammy wasn't paying the copay anymore. So her insurance would pay the portion that the insurance pays, but Tammy was not remitting the copay to Diane. Several times at the end of session, Tammy's alters would steal items from Diane's office. Apparently, Diane saw this happen and would not stop Tammy in that moment, but later on, she would ask Tammy to return the items. During these times when Diane questioned her, Tammy would claim she had no idea what happened and that she would look around her apartment to see if any of the items from Tammy's office were there. She was never able to find any of these items, and when those alters returned, they had no memory of stealing the items either, so when they returned in session. So again, Tammy claimed that her memory was good, but then we see the memory seems to be bad. Diane obtained consent for a case study, and several of the sessions were recorded. And after the recording started, there were no more thefts, but of course we still saw that the copay wasn't being remitted. So during this period, after the recordings are being made, the number of alters increased from 10 to over 25, yet only four were ever captured on video and these four were fairly similar, again, to one another, like we saw before. During one session, Diane mentioned that some of her colleagues also had clients with DID, and some of those people had over 100 alters. Tammy mentioned that she could make up more alters if needed. So Diane questioned Tammy as to what she meant by making up alters, and Tammy said that she thought if she kept processing, she could find more. She could discover additional alters, not that she was making them up in the sense of like creating them when they didn't exist. Tammy often asked for validation from Diane, wanting to know if Diane believed her and if Tammy was her most interesting and exciting client. And she expressed concerns that Diane would abandon her if her story, if her alters failed to be interesting. Tammy expressed that she had more interesting things planned for the future in terms of her disorder. So again, Diane found this to be a little bit suspect. So she questioned Tammy about this and Tammy said that she thought her disorder was getting more complicated. That's what she meant by her prior statement. The DID support group that Tammy was attending was discontinued due to people complaining of missing personal items. The other group members had implicated Tammy, but she implicated one of the alters of one of the other members. One of the group members did file a criminal complaint, however, and Tammy was arrested, pled guilty, and served two months in jail. So this is where we get the interruption in the therapy. We have a year and a half, we have the two months in jail, where of course Diane was not delivering services, and then we have a year 
after that of therapy. Upon Tammy's release from jail, Tammy signed a release so that her sister could come into the session. Now, the way this worked is that Tammy had consented to being video recorded, but the sister did as well. Even though the sister was not in the shot, like the camcorder wasn't pointed at her, she still signed the release because if she talked, it would be picked up by the camcorder in terms of the audio. So the camcorder here was usually started before the session started. So when Tammy and the sister walked into the room, the camcorder was already running, but it was turned off usually before Tammy left the session. So there would be a part of the session that they could talk without being recorded. Now during this one particular session, Diane had to leave the office for a moment to pick up something she sent to the printer. It was a shared printer, so a lot of the counselors in the office sent items to that same printer. So again, she had to walk out to pick something up. And on her way out the door, she adjusted the zoom of the camcorder just to make sure that the sister was not in the shot. Evidently, Tammy and her sister, though, believed that Diane had turned off the camcorder. They saw Diane touching the camcorder and they thought, okay, she must have turned it off. A few weeks later, when Diane was reviewing that video, that video when she was out of the office getting something from the printer, Tammy was talking to her sister and telling her sister how she couldn't believe it was so easy to fool Diane. And Tammy didn't put it that politely. Tammy also indicated that she could start a business from stealing from people like Diane because unlike that other group member that reported that Tammy had stolen things, and of course Tammy was arrested went to jail, Diane never called the police for any of the theft that occurred. Diane never called the police when Tammy took things right from Diane's office. Now surprisingly, Diane wasn't really alarmed when she saw this in the video, but she did bring in a colleague, which she was allowed to do under the consent, to watch the video with her and kind of see what they could make of it. Now the colleague said that Tammy was malingering. She saw that as clear evidence that this was not DID, but in fact it was malingering. But she also had another interesting observation. Diane's colleague spoke Spanish, and there was this part of the session where one of Tammy's alters was allegedly speaking Spanish. I talked about that before, and this happened in the session that was recorded. Diane's colleague noted that Tammy wasn't really speaking Spanish, but rather she seemed to be putting words together, but they made no sense. It wasn't cohesive speech. So after this, Diane questioned Tammy about what was going on here in the video. And Tammy said that it was an alter who was trying to derail treatment by convincing Diane that Tammy was a fraud. Diane never questioned Tammy about those Spanish words that really didn't add up to cohesive speech. Diane believed that the particular alter who was trying to speak Spanish simply never learned how to speak Spanish. So essentially, Diane didn't see anything suspect in this recording with Tammy. In this part where Tammy was talking about how she was fooling Diane, and the part with the Spanish speaking, or the lack of speaking Spanish. So neither of these items really struck Diane as remarkably unusual. Again, she found them to be consistent with the disorder. Diane continued to treat Tammy for about another year, with the goal of the treatment being to help identify all the alters. Again, we had over 25 toward the end. And to make sure that all these alters got along well, that they were happy with one another which is actually a strategy that some counselors use when treating DID. Another popular strategy is integration, which is effectively reducing the number of personalities back to the original personality. So getting each of the alters to integrate back into that main personality. So after all this, Tammy was scheduled for an appointment one day and she missed. She never returned any of Diane's calls. Diane called to find out where Tammy was and she never came back to the agency. So she was there one day for a session and never returned. The case of Tammy was presented as an actual case of DID, even after everything that happened that really seemed to point more toward malingering. Diane had considered malingering as a possibility, but ruled it out in favor of DID. So Diane presented the moral of the story as this idea that the alters were trying to interfere with treatment by stealing, by attacking the reputation, of the primary personality, so simulating malingering, and trying to convince the primary personality that DID wasn't real. So the alters were also trying to convince the main personality that Tammy had that DID wasn't a disorder. Diane noted that the manifestation of DID that Tammy had was incredibly complex and clever, 
almost clever enough to convince Diane that Tammy was malingering. Diane also declared that her treatment of Tammy was a success, as evidenced by Tammy discontinuing treatment without notice and never being heard from again by the agency. My thoughts on this. So who knows what's really going on here, but I would be worried about the accuracy of Diane's reporting and about the accuracy of Tammy's reporting based on what we see in Diane's report. Diane seemed to be convinced that this was an actual case of DID and ruled out what I believe are more plausible alternative explanations. It certainly seems like malingering. Individuals with DID do not characterize the disorder as enjoyable. They don't brag about stealing from the counselor. They don't say that they can make up more alters. The alters don't attempt to speak foreign languages that they don't know. And we do see individuals with DID have gaps in memory, and Tammy did not really seem to have gaps in her memory. She said she did, but the timing was really convenient because it's when the alters were stealing from Diane. Now, in addition to this possibility of malingering, we see that there are some borderline traits that weren't really acknowledged here. Anger, unstable relationship pattern, emotional dysregulation, affective instability. We see a fear of abandonment. Perhaps some characteristics of kleptomania were also overlooked. We saw the repeated stealing. Now, trauma has been implicated in both of those disorders. So both of those disorders really make sense in light of the traumatic experiences that Tammy reported. We also see a possibility here of antisocial personality disorder. We see violating society's norms, irritability, and deception. So a lot of different characteristics, I think, that were presented here were never really fully explored because Diane had really centered on DID. DID kind of explained everything, and all these other symptoms were just pushed to the side. At least it appears that way. It worries me that the original complaint of PTSD seemed to be ignored after the idea of DID came up. So Tammy might have been treated for something she didn't have, DID, and not treated for something she did have, post-traumatic stress disorder. When Tammy left treatment, Diane had lost over $200 in personal belongings from her office. Again, Tammy would take items from the office, and Diane would not confront her in that moment. Tammy also owed over $2,200 in co-pays, only ever having paid the first two sessions with Diane. She paid all the co-pays with the other counselor. So we see some real boundary problems here in terms of Diane's counseling, right? She let a lot of things go that she should not have. I think she wanted to relax the boundaries because she would worry that having strict boundaries would push the alters away or make Tammy feel ashamed and the alters would not really come out in session. But I look at this as really terrible counseling, right? Having these really awful boundaries and again, just not seeing obvious symptoms that were occurring and seeming to believe that DID explained everything, right? Just assuming that the DID symptoms really explained the theft, explained why Tammy was caught on the camcorder as saying that she was, in fact, lying. That's really what she was saying when she was caught on the video. Diane really excused just about everything that Tammy did and put it under this DID diagnostic label. Of course, Diane believed that DID was interesting, and I think this could have motivated a lot of what was going on in terms of Diane's poor judgment. So this case study of Tammy is certainly interesting and thought-provoking. I know that it will probably create a lot of different opinions in terms of what was really going on here. Please put those opinions and thoughts in the comments section of this video. They always generate really interesting dialogue, and I think in this case, this will be no exception. As always, I hope you found this case study on DID or malingering or whatever else was going on here to be interesting. Thanks for watching.